Leah here from LeahForSci.com, and in this video, we'll do a quick overview of alkyne reactions, including product shortcuts to help you save time on exams without having to write out the mechanism. Follow along on the alkyne reaction cheat sheet on my website, LeahForSci.com slash alkyne reactions. An alkyne is a molecule that has two pi bonds or a triple bond between carbon atoms, such as two butyne drawn here showing every atom. For the remainder of this video, I'll be showing it in skeletal structure, so make sure you know how to follow along. Alkynes are sp hybridized, which means they're linear with a 180 degree bond angle. And if you're confused, draw a dot before and after the triple bond to remind you that there are carbon atoms present. So here we have two butyne in line structure. Alkynes can undergo full reduction to an alkane or partial reduction to an alkene. As you're going through the alkyne reactions, ask yourself, how are these similar to what I studied for alkene reactions? And that will make it easier for you to memorize when you can recognize the similarities. Alkynes are just like alkenes with an extra pi bond and slightly different reactivity. For a full reduction, you react the alkyne with H2 and a metal catalyst such as platinum, which will break every pi bond and add hydrogen atoms. The trick is to break a pi, and add a hydrogen atom to each of those carbons, break the pi again, and add two more hydrogen atoms for a fully saturated alkane. Alkynes can be partially reduced to an alkene, where an internal alkyne can give you cis or trans, depending on the reaction conditions. If an alkyne is reacted with H2 and a Lindlar's catalyst, then you get a cis alkene. A Lindler's catalyst is a poisoned catalyst that reacts just like the standard metal, where the metal grabs the pi bond from the same face and adds the hydrogen to the same face of the molecule. This would be considered a syn addition for alkenes or a cis alkene product when starting with an alkyne. When subjected to dissolving metal reduction, using something like sodium in liquid ammonia, Keep in mind that a neutral sodium is a radical. It only has one electron in its valence. This will give it a radical intermediate. The electrons want to go as far from each other as possible. And what does the final product look like when electrons are as far from each other as possible? We get a trans alkene. Do not confuse the NaNH3 with NaNH2. Sodium here is a neutral radical metal where the NaNH2 is Na plus and amide NH2 minus, which acts as a very strong base. Here the NH3 is simply a solvent to give us the trans product. Hydration reactions is where we hydrate the alkyne and add an H2O. Alkenes could be hydrated with an acid catalyst or oxymercuration to give you a Markovnikov product. For alkynes, we combine the two using HgSO4 in H2SO4 in water for an acid-catalyzed hydration. Just like the alkene reaction, we break a pi bond and put the OH on the more substituted carbon atom. But since the alkyne started with two pi bonds, we still have one remaining. For a product that has both an alkene and an alcohol, giving me an enol. This is not a very stable intermediate and will undergo ketoenol tautomerization to isomerize into the keto form, in this case a ketone. Hydroboration of alkynes works very similarly, but instead of BH3, you might see different boron-containing reagents, such as R2BH, SIA for disimyl 2 borane or even 9-BBN. We still have the same conditions dissolving it in THF, for step one, and step two is followed up with peroxide, base, and water. As with oxymercuration, we first get an enol product, but this time the alcohol adds to the less substituted carbon, and this too will undergo ketoenol tautomerization, in this case giving us not the keto form, but the aldehyde form. For more on ketoenol tautomerization stability and mechanism, see the video link below. Hydrohalogenation, as the name implies, adds a hydrogen and a halogen, HX, where X could be fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. We'll use terminal alkynes so that we can pay more attention to Markovnikov and anti-Markovnikov products. If you react a terminal alkyne with HX, for example, HBr, you break the pi bond, add the hydrogen to the less substituted position, and the halogen to the Markovnikov or more substituted position. 
This reaction will typically take place in excess hydrohalogen, for example, excess HCl, so that both pi bonds break and both halogens add to the more substituted carbon. Once again, the product follows Markovnikov's rule, but for excess reagent, we get a geminal dihalide. I think of it as a gem. If I have a few, I want to keep them close. I want to keep them on the same carbon. Halogenation is very similar, except that we're using X2 instead of HX to add two halogens per reaction. If you react an alkyne with X2, such as Br2, you simply break the pi bond and put one halogen on each carbon. As with hydrohalogenation, this is typically carried out with excess reagent where you're providing more than enough halogen to add to your pi bonds. For example, if I react it with excess Cl2, I break both pi bonds and put two halogens each on the carbons that used to be triple bound. For a total of four halogens added, two per pi bond being broken. Oxidative cleavage is when you break the bond and add oxygen to that same carbon. You likely covered ozonolysis and potassium permanganate k 4 oxidation. Ozonolysis uses O3 or ozone to cleave not only the pi bond but also the sigma bond and this is followed by H2O. The trick here is to cut the molecule right between the pi bonds and add one oxygen atom for every break. The products will be different if you're starting with an internal or terminal alkyne. For an internal alkyne, you'll get two carboxylic acids. Start out by redrawing the carbon skeleton exactly as you see it, but leaving a gap where you cleave the molecule. Then simply add in a double bound O and a single bound OH for the carboxylic acid. The terminal alkyne is a little trickier. For the non-terminal end, you do the same thing as in the previous reaction. In this case, we have two carbons, so we put a carboxylic acid on the end. For the single carbon, it'll start out forming a carboxylic acid, in this case, formic acid, but this will quickly decompose to give you carbon dioxide, which is a fully oxidized carbon. Some professors will teach formic acid as the product, others will teach CO2, so make sure you figure out which one you're required to know before you memorize it. Permanganate oxidation can be carried out under different conditions for completely different products. Reacting an alkyne with potassium permanganate under weaker or neutral conditions will only break the pi bonds but not the sigma bonds. This will give us a product that initially has one alcohol added to each carbon for each pi bound broken. This gives us a total of four alcohols, which is very unstable, and so the molecule will rearrange, kicking out water and turning each set of two alcohols into a ketone. The final product is a diketone. When carried out under hot basic conditions, you get a more extreme reaction and we get a similar cleavage to ozonolysis, where you break it right down the middle and add an oxygen to each side of the cleavage for every pi bond that was broken. The only difference is that under basic conditions, you can't form a carboxylic acid, but instead you have the deprotonated conjugate base. Redraw the skeleton exactly as you see it add a carbonyl and an O- minus to every cleavage site. If you then react this with a mild acid, in this case we'll show H3O+, each molecule will be protonated for a carboxylic acid final product. In addition to reacting alkynes, you also have to know how to make them. An alkyne can be formed from a geminal or vicinal dihalide, where geminal has two halogens on the same carbon and vicinal has them in the vicinity on neighboring carbons. The alkyne is formed by two elimination reactions using excess strong base sodium amide NaNH2 dissolved in liquid ammonia. Vicinal and geminal dihalides will give you the same exact product. Terminal alkynes present a tricky extra step. Each NH2- will grab a hydrogen and eliminate a halogen, giving us an expected alkyne but the problem is, we still have a terminal acidic hydrogen atom, and another NH2- in solution will reach for that hydrogen and deprotonate the alkyne. This gives us the alkanide anion. For a two-carbon molecule, that's the acetylide anion. If your goal is alkylation, you're okay. But if your goal is simply to form the alkyne, you have to react this with water so that the very strong base can deprotonate the water molecule and regain that hydrogen atom. 
alkylation is a very useful reaction in synthesis and retrosynthesis because it gives you a way to do chain elongation, to create a longer carbon chain when you're starting with something small. Terminal alkynes have an acidic terminal hydrogen, and when reacted with a strong base like sodium amide in ammonia, the amide will deprotonate the alkyne and give us the alkanide anion. This anion makes a very good nucleophile for an SN2 reaction, because the lone pairs can simply attack a carbon, kick out the leaving group, giving you a longer chain which you can then take and subject to any of the reactions we looked at before and introduce all sorts of functional groups and reactivity. This concludes the alkyne shortcut video. I hope this video helps you quickly recognize and understand the patterns for alkyne reactions. Make sure you study these reactions from the cheat sheet on my website, layerforsci.com slash alkyne reactions. And if you found this helpful and feel that it'll help you on your exams, make sure you share it with your classmates so they can benefit too.